Good day, everybody. Welcome to the second webinar on flexible packaging. Both Canada and the European Union are pursuing ambitious goals to reduce plastic waste and achieve circularity for this widely used material. Connections and collaborations are more than ever necessary to tackle the challenges presented by this complex mission. The European Union, through the foreign policy instrument, is supporting projects all around the world that can lead to innovative practices. Reducing plastic waste in Canada is one such project. As part of the project, we are pleased to host this webinar series to promote exchanges looking at innovations and solutions to address at growing, a growing challenge and challenging part of the plastic waste stream. The series of four, of four webinars is exploring the path to creating a circular economy for flexible plastic packaging. Each webinar focuses on a distinct theme, theme and together they cover the complex system of plastic recovery with a focus on emerging policies, strategies, processes, and technologies. Throughout the series, we are bringing you the leaders in Europe that are working to achieve circularity for flexible packaging. We are grateful for the time that they are taking to share the valuable experiences and insights on the innovations they are pursuing for flexible plastics. We hope that you will learn, be inspired, and connect with others in the pursuit of your own efforts in this area. Without a more, I will introduce our moderator for today, Mr. Mike Jefferson. Mike is an accomplished and well-known leader in Europe and globally. He has 30 years experience in the waste management and recycling sector. He currently manages the European Associations of Plastic Recycling and Recovery Organizations, EPRO. EPRO is a pan-European partnership of specialist organizations that are able to develop and deliver efficient solutions for the sustainable management of plastic waste, now and for the future. Today, he brings to our webinar his ex extensive experience in the plastic recycling supply chain and deep understanding of operational, commercial, technical and policy issues on this topic. Welcome, Mike, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna, and welcome everyone uh, from, from me. As Anna says, I'm representing um, EPRO today. Um, the webinar is focused today on the collection and sorting of household uh, flexible packaging. It's the second in the series of four webinars. So the first one was looking at roadmaps and the, the following webinars will be looking at recycling. But today we're focusing on um, collection and, and sorting. And certainly here in Europe, um, it's an incredibly important topic, the, the, the collection, sorting and recycling of household flexible packaging. And there are a range of um, policy drivers, which I will just mention now by way of introduction as to why, um, why people are focused on this topic so much. In, in terms of the collection of flexible packaging within Europe, we have um, since 2018 had new targets to meet for the collection of plastics packaging, we have a target now of 50% by 2025 and 55% by 2030. And that's combined also with a new measurement point in Europe. So previously we used to measure recycling at the bale weight, leaving the sorting center or entering the recycler. And that's now moved um, to the material that enters the, enters the extruder. So again, that makes these, these targets uh, all the more challenging. We also now have a plastics levy within, within Europe, which is a mechanism for member states to pay into the uh, European Union budget. And that is set at 800 euros per ton based on the amount of plastics packaging placed on the market, which is not recycled. So again, another driver for, for more material to be collected and recycled. Um, and also we have a target, a very likely target coming in a revision that's ongoing at the moment to the, to the main packaging and packaging waste directives that all packaging placed on the market by 2030 must be recyclable. And of course, for it to be deemed recyclable, it must also be, be collected and, and, and sorted and recycled um, commercially as, as well as just from a, from a technical perspective. And then if we look at um, sorting, um, increasingly, we're looking in Europe at meeting end market demand. 20 years ago, we were more focused on collecting material because we didn't have to worry too much. There were always markets that were there to, to take the recycled polymer. But obviously, as we collect more and more, we need to look at those downstream uh, demand drivers. Uh, we also have plastic taxes in uh, just coming in the UK, uh, coming um, also in Spain and in Italy. 
which are based on recycled content to encourage recycled content. And again, we need to look at sorting to get the right qualities of material, to get the right recycled polymer to put into packaging applications uh, for people to comply with those taxes or to, to, to minimize um, the cost for their, for their businesses. Uh, and it's likely also as well, although not yet confirmed, that in the new pack packaging waste directive revision, we'll see mandatory recycled content targets in packaging uh, by 2030. And finally, we have high quality recycling, uh, a term which is used in various policy documents uh, and also uh, in legislation in Europe. And it's a big discussion topic at the moment in terms of exactly what that means in terms of high quality recycling. But certainly all of these factors combined mean that Europe is very, very focused on collecting all types of flexible packaging now and also sorting to maximize the recycling potential for those streams and the quality of the recycler that we can get from recyclers to, to meet those demand from markets such as the packaging market. Just finally, I would mention some of the facilitating factors. One is technology, and we're going to be hearing a lot about technology today. We're going to be hearing about digital watermarking and also advances in NIR and optical sorting, uh, artificial intelligence, and that's important because it helps us realize some of those aspirations. And in addition, there are economic drivers. In part, in fact, mainly I would suggest from, uh, from the policy and from the legislation, but also from CSR policies of individual brand owners as they look to use more recycled plastic in their products. And that's creating a clear incentive, an economic incentive to try and get the recycled polymer at a certain quality that can, can, can feed that, those demand uh, markets. So I'm very pleased to announce uh, that we have three excellent uh, speakers today. I'll introduce them more fully prior to the presentations, but we have Joachim Quoden, who's the Managing Director of Expra, the Extended Producer Responsibility Alliance. We have Jan de Velde, who is the R&D Technical Director for Procter & Gamble. And we have Christian Kampman, who is a Managing Director of Sorting Systems International at uh, PreZero. So before we start with the presentations, if I just do some uh, administration in terms of um, how to make the best out of today's, today's webinar, on the screen in front of you, just under the, the picture, you should see uh, the ability to change the volume of the webinar and to, to unmute. Um, and down the left-hand side, um, you should see various options. The first one is one marked agenda, which if you click will show you the agenda for today. The second is a chat function, and that's important uh, if you have any questions uh, to ask during the, the presentations or during the panel discussion at the end. Um, I'm going to try and put all of the questions into the panel discussion, um, but please, uh, if you send them through as and when you have a thought or a question, then we'll pick those up at the end. We also have a polls and question and answers tab, which we'll use at the end just to get some feedback on the session. And finally, under the resources tab, you'll be able to click on there and download the presentations from today. And I think also from the, um, from the previous webinar that we had. So without further ado, if we move on to the presentations, uh, the first presentation is from um, Joachim, Joachim Quoden. Uh, as I said, he's a managing director of experts and is expert, and he's been involved in, in EPR for many, many years. I think probably the best part of 30 years, I think, Joachim. It must be around that now. Um, so prior, prior to expert, at the beginning of his uh, career in, in EPR, he was involved in um, the Grüner uh, the Green Dot System, the original Green Dot System, if I can say, in Germany, as the head of international affairs, then as secretary general and managing director of Pro Europe and now obviously as Managing Director of Expert. So Joachim, there's no one better to speak about EPR than your good self, so if I if I you. you. Super, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this kind uh, introduction. I hope you can see me uh, or respective see my sli slides. I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here, uh, especially as it is uh, a European Canadian project because uh, we do not uh, only have uh, European members. We have since since the beginning, since the foundation of Expo nine years ago, a member from Quebec as well. I would say one of the leading EPR systems in North America and 
Canada, but we also have members now from South America, Chile, and Colombia who have started the ad adventure to establish an EPR system. So with the, the long-term experience of our European members, I think we have a quite broad expertise of the realities, the realities in waste management, uh, in packaging waste management, and realities in EPR. Because EPR is, uh, is a concept and uh, perhaps unfortunately not a business plan or a franchise system which we can just sell to another country and implement it uh, in an easy way but uh, which makes me somehow proud and optimistic in the end for the topic of today for flexible packaging uh, we know how to do it we have the intelligence uh, we have the technologies, in the end we have the financing. So if we would use everywhere the best practices, uh, and we will do it, I'm very sure, we will be able to keep uh, flexible packaging in the economic loop like we perhaps know it today from, from PET bottles or from, from gla glass bottles. And EPR and the producer responsibility organizations, they can play a very important role for making it possible because we are somehow in the middle of this circle in an optimum system. And our job is to keep this circle turning like a wheel of a, of a bicycle. And you, you all know when you are cy uh, cycling that it is easier if the, 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 the wheels are really round. And this is the job uh, of the EPR system. We have to work with all the different actors. We have to identify the gaps and not only the financial gaps. Of course, they are important, but this is only one part. So if you just, as a government, want to extract money from industry, perhaps use a taxation approach. If you want to use EPR, uh, then you have to 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 accept our uh, knowledge, experience, and our involvement, because uh, we are trying always to use the money in the best way. So we we work with all the actors, with local authorities, but also with the fillers, with the packaging manufacturers, and so on, so that every one of us is improving. Uh, uh, their part of the cycle, uh, especially by understanding what is happening to the packaging if if we are using option A or option B. So to translate the needs of a sorter uh, to to the work of a packaging designer, that's that's part of the of the work uh, of an EPR system as as as, as well. Uh, and that's that's as I said, it's not it's only a concept and not a franchise. That's why uh, every of our EPR systems around the world is a little bit different, or partly even totally different, because there are many actors who can decide how the system is looking like. In first line, of course, the na the national legislator, and it seems. Uh, my experience over the last 30 years that every legislator likes to do some national experiments just just to name the 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 three um the three states in the US who are just implementing e EPR especially Maine and Oregon using a totally different approach for EPR which is fantastic from the creativity but perhaps not the the ver very best way to move very quickly to a circular econ economy. One important part uh, to make it easier is, of course, if the whole packaging value chain is joining and, and trying to, to move forward together, huh? not, not one on the, on, on, on the burden of another, but all striving for the best. And that's why uh, CFLEX has been founded some years ago. That's why XQA is very involved in CFLEX together with, with many other co companies because we have un understood that only together we can make it happen. We can ma make it po possible, like, for example, concentrating on the collection uh, that it is, of course, the case that flexible pa packaging is collected everywhere uh, in the same way as all other pa packaging. Because only if we collect, we have a chance to, to sort and to recycle 
it. And that's that. That's a very important thing to invest in sorting. We will hear now two two speakers who will tell us what is possible to today and what will be possible tomorrow. And it's really a lot a lot what is what is helping not to talk about make it easier for re recyclers to do the necessary investments and to rely on a constant material flow. And not to forget the inhabitants, uh, they have to do the extra effort. And we have to, we as industry, we have to convince them then it, that it is worth to do this additional effort. Because only if the consumer and if the inhabitants are believing in the system, they will do it in the right way. If they think what whatever they do, it will be burned or go to landfill, they will do it in the wrong way if they if they do it. So, so we have to concentrate on 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 the parts of of the circle, as I said, uh, just to put packaging on the market, which can be collected, sorted, and recycled, uh, to help our companies to un understand what is happening with their packaging if they do a certain packaging cho cho choice. Support it financially where there is a gap. Partly even to 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 give money to a recycler if at the moment the recycling of sorted flexible packaging still needs needs a financial pull, pull, pull push another job of a good EPR system to plan in advance and to 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 uh, develop uh, the recycling market together with the various actors. That's what I talked about. So I will not spend too much time. For, for it and ju just to remind us why it is important to engage and to cooperate along the value chain with all ac actors uh, because it is it is really a, a matter which is positive taking our pa packaging uh, in the economic cir circle but it comes for a co cost eh? it is not for free especially in in the beginning until we make more and more successes and and learn a lot so at the moment just in you in U europe the whole epr systems and deposit systems uh, are costing industry seven to eight billion euros with the new legislation with the move to I would say a fully circular uh, economy. It will probably cost 20 billion, sometimes even more. And especially if we do not follow best practices, uh, but but experiment and continue for whatever reasons, uh, uh, solutions which are not very effective, effective, and efficient. So that's that's something we can only solve and improve all to get together. Uh, and what we should not for, 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 for forget in, in all the, the striving for a cir circular e economy is the even more important goal of a carbon neutrality. So we have to be smart in moving circular, having the carbon neutrality in mind that we do not harm uh, this goal by going away, which is perhaps uh, not, not fully thought through. That was my little uh, run through through EPR. Just to repeat, I think we know how to do it. Uh, we have the, the, the intelligence, the know-how, the means financially and technically. So please cooperate with us so that we convince all the other actors to follow the best practices just to make it possible and happen within the next few years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joachim. Um, as I mentioned at the start, I think if it's okay, we'll take questions at the end so we can have them in the in the panel discussion. So perhaps if we uh, move on to our, our next speaker, which is Jan de Balder uh, from Procter & Gamble. Um, Jan is the uh, R&D Technical Director for, for, for Packaging within Procter & Gamble and has been working uh, for, I think, around 20 years now on sustainable packaging design, but it, as well as being very active clearly within Procter & Gamble. He's also very active on uh, various European platforms. So in particular, he's a, a board member of PetCor Europe, which is the uh, association looking at the PET value chain. And he's also the chair of the advisory board and the, the steering board on the uh, for Reciclas, uh, which is uh, a design for recycling um, operation and platform um, originally developed by Plastics Recyclers uh, Europe. So Jan, over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for the nice introduction. Um, so indeed, let me share uh, my slide deck um, as well. Um, and indeed, I will talk uh, most of the time here on the Holy Grail 2.0 initiative, which is an initiative um, to make packaging intelligent, enabled by digital watermark technology, and use that uh, intelligence then throughout the full life cycle of a package, including uh, sorting and recycling. Good. So um, first, would like to get started with uh, really identifying the problems that we are trying to uh, to solve uh, in order then to drive circular economy, uh, circular economies for packaging. So this is um, my busiest slide ever, um, but I think it really gives you a good overview of the five important pillars. Um, the first pillar is obviously we as brand owners and retailers we need to design our packages so that they are that are getting um, recycled. And I have added here two flexible um, examples. Um, these type of stand-up pouches historically were made out of multi-materials, uh, PET-PE. Um, and we recently have been moving them into a mono-material polyethylene-based um, execution, um, which obviously have been fully tested by means of the Reciclas uh, test protocols, including sorting making sure that these items are not um, polluting, uh, contaminating actually the standard low density polyethylene uh, recycling. So these are two examples of very well designed packages. A second one, second pillar is, is all about access to collection. Um, and again, in the majority of the European member states, at least there is a kind of a, of a collection, unfortunately, between the member states, there is no harmonization. And sometimes even within the member states, if I take the UK as an example, it's also not harmonized. Uh, it's really the mu municipalities that determine what should go into the collection bin. And obviously, that's very frustrated to, uh, to the consumers uh, because they have no clue what to do whenever they would uh, drive uh, a few miles away from their homes. Um, that brings me to the consumer, which is the third pillar, um, and educating the consumer to do the right thing. So Joachim already mentioned yet that yes, we need to rely on the consumers to put the items into their collection bins. And unfortunately also here, we see quite a lot of uh, different approaches that member states are forcing us uh, to put sorting instructions in certain countries, which are then different from their neighboring countries. So also as a global and regional player, that makes it very difficult. And also here, I believe that digitizing the recycling uh, messages towards the consumer would be the right idea. And that's also where we're looking into with this Holy Grail program. A fourth one is then all about separation technologies. That's basically where the Holy Grail all got started. Um, it's a program that we started back in 2016 under the New Plastics Economy from the Ellen McCarter Foundation, where we basically looked into the value of, at that moment, there was quite a lot to do about fluorescent traces versus the item that I brought to the table was digital watermarks. And the end conclusion was that there is much more value in, in, um, in the use of, of watermarks over traces. And that's the reason why we are now keep on focusing on, on the use of watermarks in this Holy Grail 2.0 program, which I will talk in a minute. Now, if you do have those four pillars in place, you do have access to high quality and high quantities of recycled material for which you need to find end markets. And a good end market is to put it back into a packaging application, which also nicely fitting with the PNG goals of reducing our use of virgin petroleum-based plastics by 50%. So this is a global goal, uh, but we are talking here about 300 kilotons of virgin petroleum-based plastic replacements. So that's quite a big um, uh, amount. Now, Holy Grail is not only about uh, improving sorting for mechanical recycling. There is also obviously a need to control the feedstock for advanced recycling, uh, such as uh, dissolution recycling, PT uh, depolarization technologies, or feedstock recycling, uh, such as pyrolysis. And Holy Grail is also more than just plastics, because we also do have a lot of um, paper um, and liquid carton boards uh, into the mix, um, and you will see that uh, through some uh, some of the videos. Now, in a nutshell, the two biggest bottlenecks today is definitely on sorting, and then there is another bit, big bottleneck here on collection and consumer participation. If we can solve these two, um, then obviously we can talk and we will see a big increase in the recycling rates. So let me introduce quickly the Holy Grail um, 2.0 2 with a very nice animated movie from the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Let's have a look to this video. 
What if packaging could tell us its story, what it's made of and how it can be recycled? With digital watermarks that cover the surface of plastic packaging, we will be able to tell what kind it is, the types of material and usage. This means packaging can be sorted much more accurately and quickly. What if we could use this technology on a large scale? With digital watermarks, packaging can be scanned on the sorting line with a high-resolution camera that detects then decodes the digital watermarks, accurately sorting them into different recycling streams, like whether it's food safe or not, or into its different polymer types. Can it be recycled back into a similar product or maybe broken down into its components and used as a high quality feedstock for new products? Testing is already underway with the Holy Grail 2.0 project. Semi-industrial trials for phase two of the Holy Grail project are happening at the Amaga Resource Center in Copenhagen. Over 125,000 pieces of packaging from bottles to flexibles will be used. Engineers will test the system's ability to withstand the pressures of full-scale industrial operations in three parameters. The speed at which the watermarks can be detected on the conveyor belt. The accuracy of watermark detection when mixed with general waste. And the technology's ability to detect and efficiently sort the packaging into its various streams. All parts of the plastics value chain need to work together to achieve maximum impact. The project aims to introduce digitally watermarked products to store shelves in Denmark, France and Germany in the first half of 2022 for in-market demonstrations and industrial scale trials. And that makes us very excited. With intelligent waste sorting, Better recycling can be a reality for a circular economy for plastic waste. Okay, so what we basically have seen is indeed an explanation of a digital watermark. Um, basically two ways to do this. Um, the one which is obviously more relevant for flexibles is that you're just going to change your artwork. Um, so it's basically a Photoshop manipulation of your high resolution file, where we basically are trying to um, hide the different coding system. So I would use existing white ink from this area, put small white dots in the blue and vice versa. I use existing blue and put small blue dots in the white. And by doing this, I can replicate the code, the code all over um, the artwork. This is then linked uh, with attributes, linked to a standardized database, and the waste industry has access to this type of, uh, of data. So that's one way to do it. We also can do it in molds. Again, it's, it's less relevant for this group, uh, but again, I just wanted to mention so if I start uh, mold embossing every time I produce this bottle, it actually contains the coding um, as well. Now, that's the way to make the package intelligent. And then I can use that intelligence basically on an automatic sorting line. You will see in a minute what we are basically uh, needing need to do is to um, install what we call add-on modules. So this is what you see. So the add-on module is, is a high-speed cameras combined with powerful LED light and co computers. And we just plug it in into an existing near infrared sorting machine. So this way we can basically do quite a lot of different things. We can add safely items. So the one, the pouches that I was shown on my first line now can be safely added into uh, the flexible stream. We can reject items, items we don't want to see in sorting centers. So think about silicone cartridges and, and these type of things. But also important for recycler, a recycler now can think about dividing streams because I basically can sort on an SKU level. Whereas in the past, the infrared is just making a sorting on based on a material characterization and does not allow, for example, to split streams between food and non-food or even create more streams like, why not um, uh, creating uh, detergent hygiene cosmetic grades of, of PCR, which today do not exist, but obviously there is a big market um, to get them delivered. So Holy Grail 2.0, it's, it's all about focusing and, and get this one delivered into the marketplace. It's still an R&D program. Um, it's now driven by the European Brands Association and financed by the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Obviously the key focus is still on intelligent sorting, um, there are bits and pieces on consumer engagement and also the data management part developed by GS1 is a very important one. In terms of membership, we are currently over 172 members. Um, so here you see um, some of them. 
And um, must um, emphasize again, and that's also what Joachim was mentioning. I mean, we really need to have the full cross-value chain in here, right? So there are resin producers, there are fiber producers, there are converters, there is the waste industry, there are brand owns retailers and so forth. The initiative itself, it's being led by a leadership team, which I'm chairing. And obviously my co-speakers um, are also in the leadership team. But again, as a leadership team, it's again, a nice representation of a full value chain. We also do have an advisory group, again, with Packaging Europe, the Alan McCarter Foundation, the Alliance on Plastic Waste, the AGFAU, and also WWF. As mentioned, what we are trying to do, this is still an R&D program, but through three different phases, we are trying to prove the viability of digital watermarks, both from a technical uh, case, but also the business cases are important, right? Because the waste industry needs to do some investments. Also the brand owners need to do some investments in terms of their artwork. So it's again, classical chicken and the egg, which we are trying to break uh, through, this, uh, the, through this program. Again, I'm just going to go quickly over these type of things. There are different work packages. All of the members can join any of these work packages and generate knowledge. We're also comparing these technologies versus other technologies like fluorescent tracers, artificial intelligence, and standard near infrared. And we're trying to see what's really unique about this technology. So let me talk you through a couple of the different phases. Uh, phase one is all about developing units. Uh, so we have selected two machine vendors, that's Palank, ST, and Tomra. And together with Digimark, they have uh, developed these units. Phase two is basically what you just have seen in the original video from Copenhagen, that's testing the system in industrial conditions. Um, and phase three is then all about bringing these items into the marketplace. So again, let's give me Give me just a quick a summary of that phase one. I said um, that's now fully done with uh, with Palenk. And um, I just also would like to quickly show you how it looks like and explain once more, sorry for that, the concept of um, of sorting, uh, not based on the infrared, but really based on SKU basis. So what you will see in a minute is a program where we are doing category sorting. So we're basically programming the machine that all of the polyethylene and polypropylene films will be sorted out in that specific stream. We also have been running experiments where, for example, these always film packages are just sorted out positively. Right. So again, it's a complete new concept. We are based. We are basically sorting on an SKU based level, and that can. Um, control my feedstock, my bale content. I basically even can count how many items go into that bale and the bale actually now can be provided with a kind of a certificate of analysis, uh, which is completely new for the industry as well. So as mentioned, that phase one, uh, both have been um, validated now, both, both with Palenk um, and Tom Ryan. So these are the Palenk numbers, which were generated back in March. And then very recently, we also have been announcing the results for Tomra, uh, which you see are very, very similar. Phase two is then the phase indeed with semi industrial. So gradually adding waste, uh, first curbside collected, but then also at the end, we also have been adding some municipal waste um, in there really to test the system at the most extreme items. And very recently, we have been announcing the results with the first machine vendor, Palenque. And what you see here is that we have been uh, achieving very high detection, ejection, and purity levels. You see there for flexibles, the numbers 99 and 91 and 90%, which I can tell you for flexibles um, after first sort is very high. We all know that sorting flexibles, it's not an, uh, an easy job. Um, but if you can generate these type of numbers after a first sorting step, um, it's pretty good results. Then to finish off, phase three is then all about the brand owners and the retailers bringing commercial products into the marketplace. People will use those products, put it in their recycling bin, and then we're gonna put the units um, at a couple of MRFs, um, material recovery facility, one PERF, one plastic recovery facility, and two recycling plants, um, both in Germany and France. And we also will capture um, enhanced products coming out of Denmark. So as a company, obviously, we are fully committed. Uh, we have more than 100 products that we're going to put in the market or already most the majority of them are already into marketplace. And you see here a couple of examples also on film. So again, the two pouches, three pouches actually, and then also always and pamper films. And uh, very recently, we also have been uh, adding these Venus and uh, Gillette film samples um, as well. 
So in conclusion, um, and so this is a quote from the uh, DG of, of uh, European Brands Association. So it's nicely fitting with the European Green Deal, because again, in this program, we are combining innovation, sustainability, and digital. If people want to have more information, there is a dedicated website. You can see the references over here. And obviously, I'm also trying to post the latest news on LinkedIn using the hashtag Holy Grail 2. So with that, I think my time is over. Um, and obviously, we can um, discuss uh, the questions um, at the end of this event. So thanks again for listening. Jan, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting stuff. And I know that um, Holy Grail 2 is going through some really critical stages at the moment with those tests and some, some fantastic results. Um, so our final speaker before we get to the, the, the panel discussion is Christian Kampman from um, PreZero. Uh, PreZero uh, are running some of, the, some of the largest and some of the most modern um, sorting facilities in that we have in Europe. Um, and Christian is the Managing Director of Sorting Systems International at PreZero. Prior to that was the Managing Director for Recycling and in previous roles was also heavily involved in sorting. So no one better to talk us through some of the, the latest developments um, in, in sorting within packaging sorting centers in Europe. Christian? Yes, Mike, thank you very much for your warm words. I'm also very happy to, to be here and I would like to explain you something about our newest sorting plant, which we opened in January with this year in IT, which is very close to Munich. And David, could you go? Yes, thank you very much. As uh, Mike already mentioned, I mean, uh, with the plant we opened this year, we are really thinking we have one of the most modern sorting plants which are existing in, in Europe for the moment. And we, I will show you later on which advantages we see while with uh, using this new technology. Next slide, please. Um, Probably something about PreZero, which is um, uh, yeah, a quite new name in the market. I mean, PreZero was founded in 2018 as a pillar of the Schwarz Group. You see here our four activities we have. We have, of course, Lidl and Kaufland, which uh, is known very well, especially in Europe. I mean, Lidl and Kaufland together are one of the five biggest retailers in the world, turnover with something about 100 billion uh, euro in 2021. We have also um, a production part where we produce, for example, ice cream, coffee, fruit, stuff like this. And we have as a fourth pillar PreZero. PreZero is now working in 11 countries for the moment. We have a turnover something like this 400, uh, 4 billion euro. And uh, we are operating at the moment a seven sorting plant. And as I mentioned before, um, the one in IT is the latest one. Next slide, please. What is... Um, uh, what is what is driving PreZero? What is driving the, the Schwarz Group? And what is probably unique in the market? Uh, as I mentioned before, Kaufland and Lidl really would like to take over the producer's responsibility. And uh, as you understand from my co-speakers, especially from, from Joachim, he was mentioning a lot about uh, EPR systems and, and EPR itself. So um, Lidl and Kaufland have in Germany their own green dot system. So we have, first of all, the production and packaging bringing into the market. We have then our own EPR system. We have via our waste managed activities uh, the possibility to collect the material. We have as another part of our, of our circle, of course, the sorting activities. For the moment in Germany, we approximately sort material for uh, 20 to 25 million inhabitants, which is, which is really a lot. So, as you can see, there are really possibilities for PreZero, for the Schwarz Group, to sort more, more material than they bring into the market. So this is something which is very unique. Of course, we have a lot of uh, uh, recycling activities um, at the end of the value chain. So we have um, recycling activities in, in, in plastics, of course, but also in, in aluminum. And of course, we try to um, um, build up other recycling activities for other packaging materials which might be possible in the near future. Um, as Gian also mentioned, we are also part of, of Holy Grail 2.0, so we hope uh, to have a good, yeah, or good um, experience, or we had good experiences from the first Holy Grail project. So we really believe also with digital water market and stuff like this that we can, of course, increase um, the sorting. Um, um, results and um, the, the material which can be sorted out between food 
and non-food. So we really see a lot of opportunities in that area. So of course, also artificial intelligence and other things are very important for us because I mean, to, to sort material, to have the technique in the installation is, is one is one part, but also the other part to use intelligent machines, uh, to use in, intelligence um, also in, in, in having a look how you can sort the material, because as you probably can imagine, a uh, material which is sorted from, from household pa packaging place is not uh, looking the same in every area and also not in every country means when you collect materials in cities, it looks a little bit different when you have material from the countryside. Also, this we would like to take much more in consideration in the near future to uh, react better on the material that we have better sorting results. Let's start, please. Yes, uh, our sorting plant in, in Eitling, close, uh, close to Munich, where we are very proud of, was built really in, in, in 10 months of construction time, which, which is really, really a short period. Also, when you take into consideration that most of the part were much influenced by the COVID situation we all have. We hopefully look, uh, ho or we hopefully think that we will have this behind us, but of course, it was not easy in those times to do everything in time. For the moment, we have a sorting capacity um, with re regards to German material of 120,000 things um, there. And what is the most important thing and more or less uh, the innovative part of it is that we do not any longer sort out only 10 or 11 or 12 uh, fractions at the end of the sorting pr process, but we do sort out 18 different fractions. Um, the important thing here is that we pretty believe also for the next step in the value chain, so for all recyclers, that it is much more easier for them to uh, work with material which is uh, more dedicated, which is uh, sorted in a better way and which they can handle then in their washing and extruding processes much more better. So the unique and new thing what we do here is that we do not sort out the typical film fraction, which is common in, in Europe called uh, 310 LDPE film. No, at the end of the day, we have uh, four different kind of film fractions which we um, sort or which we create. Yeah, We have a colored fraction, we have a transparent fraction, we have a white one, and we also separate um, the PP film, which can be very, very good used by um, PP recyclers, so it's easier for them to use this in their process. They can mix it up with 3D PP material, so it is also added value for the recyclers. Furthermore, of course, we have um, fractions which are more or less common for, for many years, talking about um, the tin plates, for example, aluminium, beverage cartons, paper, and all this stuff. What is also what we are also doing, and we hope there will be a solution for the near future, is that we sort out <coughs> sorry, uh, the PET trays. Yeah? For PET trays at the moment, it's quite hard to find a good mechanical recycling way. There are many, many recyclers which try to use this material, but for the moment we unfortunately have to say that there is no recycling way for PET trays which really, really works at the end of the day. So um, the question is how this part can be developed. I mean, in Germany we are talking about a content of approximately 3 to 4% of the whole lightweight packaging content, PET trays, so this is really one of the most there are interesting things for the near future. Probably also digital water markets can help us here to find better solutions um, for recycling of the PET trays. What we can now recognize in the market with the first material we deliver to our recyclers is that they really say, okay, this concept to have different sorted material, especially fill material, is really, really better for us. Their recycling process is going smoother. Of course, the residues they are producing in their process are smaller than before. So from this perspective, it really looks like uh, that this approach is working. Furthermore, talking about the 3D material, which is typically um, PP, HDPE. Also in the future, it was mixed between colored, white, and transparent. We also do the same here with what we do with, uh, with the fill material. So we produce a white and a colored fraction for PP and HDPE. Also with this uh, material, our own recycling company, Pizio Polymer, uh, Polymers, has some very, very good experiences. So also for them, it is much more either easier to proceed this material. The quality at the end of the day is uh, of, of the recyclates or regenerates is it's much more higher and much more better. 
and also for their process it is uh, very good that they have this different kind of input type so also here in this field and this area it looks like um, that this approach is working very well and probably this might be the way uh, for the near future that you find a way or that you use the approach where you sort out more materials or where you um, divide the material at, as, as much as possible also to reduce transportation costs to the recyclers also to uh, um, reduce for example the using of water which is a very important thing uh, at, at plastic recyclers so there might be different opportunities and different um, yeah, solutions which help both sides the sorting facility and also the recyclers. Next slide please. I mean, um, just only some impressions. We also have YouTube videos about our installation in Eiting. And if you are in, in Europe or if you come over to Europe to the EFAT, which is taking place at the end of the month, of course, you can, you can visit us there and you will see uh, how this, this proceeds. Uh, for the moment, we have in our installation in, in Eiting 38 NIR separators, just to give you an, another figure and in installations which we built in 2019. We had only 24 of four of them, so it means at the end of the day that we more or less doubled um, the amount of NIR separators, which is for us uh, the key for for sorting out that much uh, fractions, as I mentioned before. We also have a sorting robot in place. Uh, sorting robots, from from our perspective, is uh, yeah we see it a bit critical. Uh, we we believe it can help to to assure quality at the end of the process. But uh, we also see that still we are struggling with the technique. So the, the movement of the robot arm is, from our perspective, not fast enough. You usually have also some, some technical items that it works in an appropriate way. So sorting robots, there has to be, from, from our perspective, an additional development in the near future that they really can uh, yeah, work like we, like we want them to work. So basically, we have to say NIR technology is, is working very, very well. Uh, we have had good developments in the in the last years in, in that area and as i mentioned before and as you can see it is obviously helping us uh, to to uh, increase the sorting yes to to run such an installation just to give you an imagination or a figure is that we are that we have installed there at uh, 272 conveyor belts so the, the installation is, is for that reason and for the amount of nir uh, separators they are quite large and you need you need a bit of space to do so and to, to operate it but 272 conveyor belts 38 nir separators means also that you have to be able to to run the um, facility or the installation from the technical point to to organize the wide throughput to organize the wide availabilities which is from the economical part very important for us so just building a sorting plant, having a lot of technique in and not knowing how to manage and how to operate it. Yeah, it's good, but it's not helping you at the end of the day. And we are quite proud that also due to this quite complex technology, that the installation is, is working really on a high availability level and can also uh, show the, the throughput which we would like, uh, which we experience, uh, what we um, would like to have there. So. At the end of the day, we, we really believe uh, with sorting and the combination between sorting and recycling um, and to, to produce things which can be used easier by the recycling is more or less one of the keys in the circular economy. Um, the results for the moment look uh, very well. Of course, we, all, we always can uh, increase and can getting, can getting better in our approaches, but uh, for the moment, it is definitely the case that, that sorting in more fractions, sorting with uh, um, innovative solutions is really helping circular economy, is helping um, uh, to avoid ecological costs, and at the end of the day, is helping us to um, bring with recyclates and regranulates back into the package. Thank you very much. Christian, thank you very much. That's that's really interesting. And I was watching your presentation and it reminded me, I think, quite how far we've come as an industry. I think it must have been, I was trying to think when, maybe 1994, 1995, when I saw the first NIR machine in the UK and we're all amazed that it had a 60% efficiency rate in terms of uh, capture of material. So really it's been incredible, incredible developments over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, Brilliant. Well, 
everyone has been very well behaved in terms of the timing of the presentation. So we have lots of time for, for questions and a, uh, and a panel discussion. So we've got some questions coming through now. I, obviously, I'd encourage other people to, to put their questions in that question and answer tab that you've, you've got on the left hand side of your, your screen. But maybe if we start with some of the questions we've got at the moment. Um, Joachim. Uh, we've got a question on eco-modulation, and uh, the question is, what role can it play in terms of a collection and sorting of flexible packaging within Europe? And, and maybe as part of that, you can just give a, a very brief overview of where we're at with eco-modulation in Europe at the moment. Of course, uh, money is always a good incentive. Huh? And uh, if, if as a, as a brand brand owner and uh, packaging producer you have a choice between several options uh, you will have a look uh, how much money the respective choice will cost you so if you if you have to pay more for a non-recyclable flexible film and less for a recyclable version uh, i get, guess that will motivate and push industry even more uh, to to a recyclable flexible fi film at the moment, uh, I have to say we do not have too many countries with a fee modulation system at the moment. F five or six. The other 20 are str struggling with their legislation respective if you have a competitive environment. So uh, not only one PRO, but 10, 15 or e even more in some countries. Uh, it is quite difficult to, mo to modulate because if one, one PRO is somehow punishing one kind of packaging, there will be surely a competitor who will tell that they can do it uh, for less money. So, for example, in Germany, they the PROs have decided and, and are promoting that there should be a joint fund uh, to take the environment out of competition. No? So that, that's hindering a few countries to, to implement uh, fee modulation at the moment. But we have good examples in Italy, in, in Belgium, in, in Netherlands, in France, uh, where you can see how you could do it uh, and what, what are the pros and cons. Again, as, with, as always with EPR, uh, there's not one solution at the moment. There are several ones. But as far as we understand, uh, in all the countries, the same packaging is promoted uh, and the same packaging is non-promoted. So the, the idea that eco-modulation in jet, jet general should push uh, is, is still okay. And as well as the eco-modulation in terms of um, uh, design characteristics and design for recyclability and, inc and encouraging that, um, are we also seeing more granularity in terms of the fees charged? Because, I mean, 10 years ago, there was kind of one fixed rate for, for plastic, one fixed rate for paper. Is, 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 is that changing? And if it is, do you think we'll see more of that in the future? Yeah, our Belgium friends from FOS Plus, I think they have the most granular system at the moment with 20 or 25 different fee categories. But, of course, it means on the other side that industry will have to to report in, in much stronger granularity as well. Uh, in most of the countries, the few countries that have modulation, we, we are seeing at the moment more simple so solutions with a different, just a differentiation between what is recyclable and what is non-recyclable. But I think on the long run, mid-term run, we will see more granularity, especially if, if the Commission will add recycled content and so on. So we will need probably much more re reporting and can then make the fees even more granular than today. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Jürgen. And Jan, um, some questions coming in on, on, on the Holy Grail project. So do flexibles pose any particular benefits or difficulties for sorting with digital watermarks? Yeah, so I think, again, I mean, we were very well, very well surprised with the results we were getting. Um, and I'm just now quoting actually Palenque as well um, on this one. Um, as we know, and as I was mentioning, I mean, sorting flexibles is not, not an easy one. Um, but the results were, uh, were very good, right? Um, again, the system can still improve, right? I mean, you've seen the detection numbers are, are very high. Ejection numbers are, are somewhat lower, and, and that's obviously has to do with 
I still call it the old-fashioned way of, of <laughs> kicking out with, with air nozzles uh, the items, which is more difficult on, on flexibles versus, uh, versus rigids. But that's you know not not so much to do with with the technology on on itself, right? Um, but overall, very good uh, very good results um, at at the end of the day, right? Um, yeah. And if if we move um, to to using a digital watermarking system, do you think that will mean there will need to be any changes in in packaging design? How how complex is it to actually put that digital watermarking? Onto the onto the packaging, you made it look quite quite simple in the presentation. But are there are there any challenges that the might we might face? Yeah, I think in the last let's call it uh, six to eight months, we have been um, learning a lot. And when I say we, it's it's really the work package two and two and three. Work package two is focusing on two D enhancements. Work package three is on on three D, so on on multi enhancements. And the good thing here is that I mean we're all working together, right? So. It's 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 good to see that I mean even competitors in the room obviously with with the antitrust rules um, in in position as well, but we're all working together to to make it work. Um, let's say like three four years ago, the enhancements were much more visible, um, especially for the designers and the brand, uh, the marketeers, right? Let's call it like that. And yes, this is still an R and D program, so. We always have to go back to our marketeers and and designers. So I'm basically as an R&D person, I'm touching their brand equity, which obviously they don't like too much. Um, so there is a need to to hide them in a very very efficient way. Uh, but as I said, we have been running um, some nice experiments on metallized uh, fairy pouches as one of the examples. And the exam, the uh, the strategies we had in place back in 2018, then it was very clear where the enhancements was. But nowadays, it's it's much better. Now, obviously, everything is linked with the amount of inks you have available, printing technology, and so forth. Uh, but we see some some big steps in in terms of the enhancements uh, being conducted. That it's um, more and more invisible to, towards consumers. We we still call it imperceptible. Um, so an average consumers consumer won't notice it, but obviously, yes, we are all working in big brand branding companies, and as mentioned, designers and marketeers can be somewhat more sensitive whenever I'm touching the artwork or or the aesthetics of a packaging item. Yeah, I imagine. I imagine we've got some more questions coming through for you, but I'm just going to jump to to Christian if I if I if I can. I mean, clearly from all of the technologies that we've now got on the market and the de development of the, the NIR and mixing with other sorting devices and optical sorting, we can sort in an increasing level of, uh, of granularity. I mean, for you, how, how do you decide as a business the level of granularity that you're sorting into? So, for example, I could see that you're sorting not just by, by, by polymer types, by format types, but by colors as, as, as well. And... How do you think, as Europe, we should we should look at this? Or what are the challenges we have as Europe? Because obviously you're running some quite large sorting centres, but there are also quite small sorting centres in Europe. So what's the kind of decision-making process in how best to, to 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 sort and the granularity into which you're sorting? Yes, uh, yeah, very good question, Mike. I mean, in all um, bigger sorting facilities or sorting centres which we are operating in Europe, not only we, but also our competitors, I mean, it really should be the aim to, to sort as granular as possible. Yeah? The question is, what are we going to do with, with the smaller sorting facilities where you probably do not have the space or where you do not have the, the relevant amount of, or quantity of input material? I mean, uh, to, uh, to buy 30 all, uh, 38 NIR separators, you need a critical input amount. So this doesn't obviously make sense when you only sort 30 to 40,000 tons. So the answer can only be that we have of course, as, as much as possible, larger and bigger sorting centers. That could be one answer. The other answer is for the smaller ones, which we probably need in some areas, because it also does not make sense that you transport material from one, um, from one city 500 or 800 kilometers to a, uh, to a sorting center. We probably then have to look, okay, what can they produce? And is there a possibility for, for some kind of after treatment at the recyclers, or probably is there a possibility that we um, put this material also in, in our sorting center only for the film part or for the polyolefin part? 
Okay, so there might be some 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 pre-sorting at the uh, at the recycler as well. I mean, do you see potentially in in countries that might have smaller sorting centres a role for a kind of intermediary operator? I mean, in in the UK, it's called a PERF, a plastics recovery facility. So in other words, a facility that might take more more mixed polymer material from from sorting facilities and then do more of a granular sort as as well. Do you do you see that as part of a possible answer? Yes, this could be definitely part of the possible answer. I mean, especially when we talk about countries where, uh, which are, are quite big, where have, have a huge size, but not that many inhabitants per square meter. There it can be a goal that you say, okay, we have some kind of sorting centers where we, for example, produce some kind of mixed plastics, of MPO, stuff like this. And we bring this to a, to a pre-treatment sorting center, however we call it, which might then produce fractions for... Um, Recyclers, so for mechanical recycling, which might also produce probably fractions which can be used in chemical recycling processes. So this can be part of the of the of the idea. Of course, you really have to look how is the the, the the situation in each country, or better to say, in each area. Okay, okay. And, and with, with household flexible packaging, one of one of the characteristics in, in in terms of being able to provide the functionality in certain. Um, items is, is composite structures um, or uh, multi multi polymer structures, barrier layer structures as well. And, and from from some of the analysis that that, that I've seen, it, it looks obviously it depends on the country, but in Europe it's quite typically around 60% mono PE and, and PP, and maybe around roughly 40% might be more complex structures. I mean, how how good is the the sorting equipment these days? For example, NIR equipment to be able to uh, to, to separate out those different types of structures. I mean, when you when you have a look to the sorting process, uh, we we do some kind of of I would like to say positive sorting means when we use our NIR separators, we are going to shoot for the monolayers. So we are shooting for the HDPE, for the PP. We can also shoot for the different uh, colors and stuff like this. And the multi -layer layers will, at the end of the day, hopefully not be detected by the NIR separators. And we, you are gathering them in this so-called MPO fraction. So we are, we believe that the purity of the mono layers we produce is, is quite high. But at the end of the day, of course, when you have a multi-layer with 85% uh, LDPE content, 10% PA and, and, and other stuff, the NIR um, separator might detect it as LDPE. So then it is, of course, a problem. But with the latest technology, it, it, the purity is getting better and better. But of course, multi layers will be and are a big problem for all of us. Okay. And Jan, I, I, I guess Holy Grail is one possible solution here in terms of being able to identify exactly what's in a, uh, what's in a packaging format and, and, and where, it, where it should go. Um, but but if, but if I ask you the question, I mean, obviously there are, there are lots of advantages that we could we, we can identify with, with with Holy Grail and other technologies to to, um, to separate using watermarks. Um, but if you could pick just one in terms of the policy drivers and where I mean you're very familiar with the policy and where we're going with the policy in Europe, where do you what do you think is the biggest advantage of uh, of Holy Grail? Where can it add most advantage uh, in terms of its place in the market? Yep. Yeah, next to improving the qualities and the quantities of PCR in the EU, in the EU market, um, which we have been calculating can be roughly anywhere between 1,500 and 3,500 extra ki kilotons per year of PCR. I think from a policy point of view, the, the full data granularity is a very important one, right? Because this technology for the first time would give you effective numbers, like how many how many um, items of a specific SKU are being put um, in the recycling bin by a consumer, right? Because we basically can count them at the entrance of a MRF. How many are effectively being sorted? That's another number. How many are ending up at the recycler, right? We can count them again. So it gives you quite some realistic, uh, real recycling numbers. And I think that's very important for policymakers because at the end of the day, that also then can be combined feedback back to the eco modulated fees, yeah, modulation fees, right? So governments um, can say like, okay, if you have a specific recycling number above 60%, I'm just making it up, you have, um, you can enjoy the lowest EPR fee. Um, and so 
this um, this is I think one of the the big things that um, that Holy Grail also uh, could uh, could deliver, um, and it's all obviously also linked with the digital product passport that the EU wants to implement as well, right? So again, there's quite a lot of, of benefits um, for the time being. It's um, the key focus would be for us at this moment really on proof that it works from a sourcing point of view. But besides that, there's also quite a lot of other use cases and, and digital product passports and you know effective real life numbers on the recycling. I think it's a big one. Yeah. Okay. As far as I un understand, we could add also in information in, in into the watermark how the inhabitants should sort their packaging. Eh? So that's that that's an advantage as well. We are all moving more and more to app users and so on. So if we have if we would have a doubt in our area connected with the GPS, uh, this this technology could tell us whether to put it in the in the paper bin in the plastic bin or where wherever so i think uh, whatever digital solution will come they will have to come because they really offer a full variety of options in the future okay it's an important point so as well as as well as use from a, an industry perspective in terms of sorting there's also a potential use for uh, for consumers as well and Joachim, do you think that 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 kind of detail and data that that we might get um, from from using something like Holy Grail would be of interest to, to EPR schemes, but also, I guess, to industry who, who own the EPR schemes as well in terms of being able to see what's passing through the system. Yeah, I think this is the future. Huh? Uh, when, when we all started the e EPR, EPR systems, our job was to reach a target uh, for the lowest costs. But I think we, we have a mind shift in, in the last four, five, six years huh? uh, because we want in the meantime to make all our packaging as circular and as carbon neutral or positive as possible. So uh, uh, this, this, will, this will also mean as a consequence that uh, those companies uh, that, that are behaving in the best way would like to see and understand their their results and their performance. Huh? So I think this goes hand in hand. So so it, we will need these tools to 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 be even more fair than we are trying to be at the moment. Okay, excellent. And 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 you okay, I mean, you touched on the the CFLEX criteria for circularity, the the the, the, the criteria that's been put put forward in terms of how. EPR can can support flexible packaging, collection, sorting, and recycling, and, and the different areas of focus. And it's there are quite. I know you were involved. You were you were you were you were involved in the, in the working group that were was developing that. And clearly, there are a lot of criteria. I think it's probably thirty or forty different criteria. Which which of those um, do you think are, are most important in terms of where the EPR systems can have? Um, most impact would be my first question and as a second question what's the sort of gap from um in terms of where we are now in europe to where cflex would like us to be in terms of that criteria for circularity yeah yeah i, I, I think uh, we we have changed our idea of what is recyclable huh? that, that is for me the most important thing in the past as I always say, we needed to find one professor with one lab who was able to recycle one packaging, and then uh, a company was allowed to label the packaging as re recyclable. Nowadays, we combine it with the rea reality. Huh? Can we collect the packaging? Is it collected? Is it sorted? Is there a mar market? And I think this is the, the most important sh shift in thinking and in behavior. But of course, it puts a lot of us under pressure, not only for film eh, or all these small items uh, that, that we use in, in, in hotels, the very small shampoo bo bottles and, and so on. Either we find a solution for, for, for this or we will have to change to change change it they are out, out of the market so i think this this is for for me the, the most important thing and change and uh, uh i i see that the biggest ga gap in in se several countries is a very weak legislation and uh, no 
no interest of the government uh, in the system. They, they, in the best case, they copy what Brussels is is uh, telling them on paper, but then they go away and leave industry alone and and leave the market alone. And it's like with a with a speed limit. Uh, it's fine to have a speed limit of 100, but if no one is controlling it, I'm afraid minimum the Germans would not follow it. Huh? So you need enforcement. Huh? Okay, brilliant, thank you. And you linked into a nicely into a question we've had here come through. So Christian, this is one, one for you. In terms of uh, your, your plant in Etting, um, are you able to capture the small format flexibles um, that come through the system? I guess that's a question in terms of screen sizes at the beginning of the process. Uh, you're on you're mute. muted. Sorry for that. Yes, uh, um, it is more or less uh, possible. I mean, when you have a look to the sorting process, you start usually with a sieve drum, yeah, where you uh, create different fractions that you bring uh, through the sorting facility. So usually you have zero to 20 millimeters where this small flexible then should fall through and Former times, they went to uh, direct to the residues. So at the end of the day, they were incinerated. But we we implemented some kind of recovery uh, lines. So we bring some of this smaller material, which is a flexible or a tin pit, pit plate or whatever, yeah, back to the system. So therefore, yes, it is possible. But a question at the end of the day, if it is uh, contaminated with, with organic uh, a lot, then of course it is not possible. But yes, there is there is a possibility. Um, but also, to be honest, I don't think that uh, we will recover more than fifty or forty percent of those. And um, I mean, you have a good overview of the sorting centres, I think, across Europe because you're active in various different countries. And and you mentioned 20, 20 millimeter, um, which I think is is uh, not uncommon in, in in Germany, but I think in a lot of Europe that, that would be considered quite a small screening size. Yeah, I mean, I think most of Europe is not not at that level yet. Yeah, only be... de yeah, def definitely. I mean, um, <laughs> it's, it's it's as Joachim mentioned. I mean, it, it is all driven by the legislation. Uh, I mean, we all know that it is not that easy to reach uh, the German goal of the packaging law yeah, by the sorting centers because uh, of the high yeah, uh, organic content of the material. Yes, in other countries, of course, uh, the sizes are higher, but this has something to do at the end of the day that they, for the moment, do not have the legislation where they have to reach uh, high goals. Yeah. So, for example, if you say, okay, you only have to recover 30% of the plastics, of course, then you say, okay, we start with the sieve drum 0 to 40, the material disappears, and then for the bigger parts, it is definitely easier to sort. So once again, uh, all what the technique is doing is following more or less the goals and aims you have uh, created by the politicians at the end of the day uh, written in the law. So in terms of some of the sorting that you're now doing, I mean, I mentioned at the beginning that we have those high European targets. I think even in Germany, they're high. Yes, you have a national target if I remember correctly, of 63% at the moment, is it? Yeah. Um, so is that part of your, I, I guess you're saying that's part of your thinking as well in terms of what you might be recovering from the mixed plastic and trying to target in terms of meeting those higher targets? Is Would that be fair to say? Yes, it would. Yeah. Definitely. I fully agree. And another technical question for you. Um, black plastic, you mentioned black plastic in your in your presentation and the difficulties of NAR units identifying it. As a question here, is there a special carbon-free black ink that um, manufacturers of packaging can use that will facilitate sorting in the sorting centers? Whoa, uh, a very good question where we where I have to be honest, I cannot answer at the moment. So what, what we are doing with, uh, with black plastics, and it's uh, we have to be honest also there, uh, um, the NIR separator is only detecting black doesn't matter what black means. So it can be plastic, it can be textiles, it can be anything. Uh, from the first trials we had with those materials, we have a black plastic content of approximately 90%. So typical flower pots and stuff like this are, are in black. So uh, it is a good approach. It helps to recover material. But the figure for the moment is 
it's approximately 1% of the whole lightweight packaging content we are operating in a, sort of, uh, in a sorting facility. Okay. I don't know if anyone else has any input on that point. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's important to, uh, I mean, obviously we, we have a few black packages in the market uh, with near infrared detectable items, uh, specifically in master batches. I think for the flexibles, yes, those those inks uh, do exist. The question is uh, always if you would need them, right? Because um, it, it all depends on the ink coverage on your package and the thickness of your ink layers. And so the best thing you can do is, is definitely do a sort test. Um, and, and obviously there are sorting protocols. I mean, I'm just referring to the one from Resi class, which gives you a good idea whether or not it's gonna be detected, right? So everything depends on like, like any question in sustainability land, but everything depends on ink coverage, uh, thickness and so forth. But again, if there are troubles, um, then these type of inks do exist, yes. Okay, okay. Um, Joachim, I mean, do you, do you have any thoughts I, I know for, for... Most of most of the people attending today are, are likely to be from 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 Canada. I mean, do you have any thoughts on on the optimal collection system for for flexible packaging? I know CFlex have a have a view in the criteria in terms of how that's that's done. But I, I if I remember correctly, in in, in Canada, there is, there is quite a lot of single stream collection, so all of the recyclables collected together. Is that something that we uh, we see in Europe, and also the collection of flexible packaging through those routes? Um, I, I'm not a friend to collect all all uh, packaging in in one bin. No? I think I think there is common sense in Europe, everywhere. I don't know common sense that uh, gla glass should should be kept away from paper and plastics. No? Fantastic material, but uh, can contaminate. As far as I un understand, these two materials. I know that you can collect it with metals that seems to be po possible so this can be commi commingled as far as i understand uh, it, it is not a problem to collect plastics all kinds of plastics together with metals and beverage cartons huh? this can be sorted in a good way what is from so I, I think you should have in the best case three Three, three bins or containers or solutions, one for glass, one for paper, because you usually have enough material for pa paper if you collect it together with the ma magazines and sheets and so on, and one for plastics, metals, and beverage car cartons. That seems for me an optimum solution. What is extremely important uh, for, for a big success is that you keep the bio waste and so on out out of the, the this and, and and I've learned from from my members that as soon as a local authority is introducing a special collection for bio waste, the amount of packaging collection is increasing as well. Not to talk about a big increase in the quality. Hmm? So uh, that that's why we need. Ho Holistic systems with the municipalities and and a, and a complete offer to our inhabitants, huh? and not not these uh, picky things to concentrate here and to concentrate there. Uh, that that's ex extremely important. Okay, great, thank you, Joachim. And Christian, do you have any views on that from a from a sorting center operator perspective in terms of how best to collect the flexible packaging, what the stream should be? Yes, of course. I, I mean. Definitely, we prefer separate collection. Um, and when separate collection is organizing wire bags, this is also better than wire bins because, unfortunately, you have more content in bins which is, should not be should not be in bins. Yeah, what I absolutely agree. What what you are mentioned, of course, we we have to separate glass. Yeah, I I mean we we also do the glass recycling. So um, mixing up glass and metal. It's also not that ideal. I would like to say it's possible. I mean, in Denmark, it is done like this, but uh, preferable, we would like to say it's better to separate packaging waste. So it can be plastics, beverage, cuttings, paper, the whole stuff. And glass, that's the most important. And of course, paper. Yeah? That's the most important things at the end of the day. But definitely, we prefer separate collection and, if possible, in bags, not in bits. Okay, I think they um, they just described the Belgium system. Uh, I might be a bit biased um, <laughs> because I'm a Belgian, but um, I think it's worth noting that I mean the Belgium false plus system is very uh, effective 
um, even without the DRS deposit return system, we are able uh, to get 90% or above 90% of PT bottles back. And it's probably the only country in the world which uh, which is able to do this, right? And we indeed are working with, with bags, a very well uh, education of, of people, which obviously will take generations. But I mean, um, I was raised that way, probably my parents as well. But um, if you... I think ask about a very effective system, um, then people really should have a look into the Belgium uh, system, which obviously is also a member uh, of Expra. No, no. Also, I, I think for, from the governance and transparency, uh, I think it, it, it is the best practice huh? to, to say it this way, uh, a very inclusive approach, uh, municipalities and I industry wor working closely together, which was unfortunately never so much the case in Germany. I think that that is one of the weak points for me in, Ge in, in, in Germany, uh, that the municipalities were never um, totally on board, on, on board uh, which makes the system more, more difficult on one side. But if, if they are on board, then it makes the system very strong. Yeah, yeah, and, and certainly in Belgium, as a resident in Belgium as well, I mean, the bags are transparent here, so certainly if, if, if the wrong material is in the bag, then there's a sticker put on the bag, and so, yeah, I guess uh, I guess that obviously helps with the quality at the sorting centre. Um, and Christian, I've got a, a question to test you, to test you here about composition of what comes into your testing centres. Um, very specific capacity here, but I guess we could talk generally about percentages. In terms of the input into your sorting centers in, in Germany, so that would be the light packaging fraction uh, for people that aren't familiar with it, what roughly what percentage of that is, is, is flexible packaging? So the bags and the pouches and the household films? Yeah, know? it's approximately, yeah, yeah, of course. It's, um, I would like to say, approximately uh, 15 to 20 percent. It depends a bit, a little bit how you, uh, how you sort it, but when you have a look uh, to, to, to iting, you can talk about 20%, 50% film content, and the additional 5% to 7% MPO flex, which is more or less also a 2D fraction. Yeah, and I think it's probably worth mentioning as well in, in terms of putting that in context. In Germany, obviously, there's a deposit return system on all of the PET bottles now, yes, yeah? so all of the PET beverage bottles. So that would, the figure might be slightly different in, in countries that don't have that, that DRS. And Jan, um, you mentioned a chicken and a chicken and egg during your presentation. I mean, clearly, if we're if we're going to be using digital watermarking, we need two things: we need packaging producers to put the digital watermarks on, uh, and we also need sorting centres to have the equipment to 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 read the digital watermarks and and to sort them correctly. Uh, how do you, do you have any thoughts on how we deal with that that challenge, that chicken and the egg? What what needs to what needs to, who needs to move first to to move this forward? Very good question. It's the chicken and the egg is, has been the, the the story of my life for the last six years, right? Um, so we we try to get there on on a kind of a voluntary basis first, right? I think all of the brand owners and and retailers we all made pledges. We are all looking for more PCR material, which today is not available, and this is one way to get more, right? Um, because you can revalorize much more PCR going back into packaging applications. On the other hand, indeed, the industry, the waste manufacturers need to um, to uh, invest in these type of add-on modules. And they're only going to do it, I mean, either there is a good return of investment, and, and we are calculating those ones as well as part of the work package on business development, or they are getting, you know, subsidies from, from governments, right? And we're also looking into European recovery funds to, um, to get some funding to do these type of movements. I think the best way is still on a voluntary basis. I mean, we, we do have very uh, two very well dedicated recyclers in the group um, that have seen the light and have seen the value um, and especially the return of investments um, in order to get to uh, towards better quality, right? So it's all about controlling their feedstock to eventually also make food grade polyolefins, which today is not uh, the case as an example, right? And so we, we, we gradually will, will move into first the three countries, as mentioned. Later on, we'll hopefully we'll expand it in, in more. And as I said, we will start on, on a voluntary basis. And, and maybe in the future, it, it, it even could be mandated, right? 
can be mandated for also for other use cases. It didn't talk about fast checkouts by retailers and, and others. But one way or another, we hope to to crack the chicken and the egg, right? And, and if there is any time to do it, it's definitely right now, making sure that it's it's in, being installed in at scale before 2025, because that's that's the target date where a lot of us needs to deliver. And, and Joachim, I mean, do you think that there's any role for, for EPR here in terms of facilitating these 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 new technologies uh, and develop them, developing them and um, industrializing them on the market? Yeah, I I think there should be, and and there is a big big role for e. EPR systems. Uh, if if we, we we call for tender, uh, we we are telling somehow the sorters. Uh, we can tell the sorters what they should sort sort out. And if we increase the the quality criteria at at, the, at a certain moment in time, there might only be the chance to use this new uh, a, a equipment to to fulfill it. Huh? So so I I think we. If, if we if we have the targets, if we have security for our business, uh, then then I think this will be a logical step step by step. If if you have seen in Belgium when Fos Plus was sure about the legislation, they did this investment uh, to that five new sorting pl plants were built within a ve ve very short time frame. I think pre pre zero was one of the uh, successful bidders as well. So. This is what we need. We need uh, security. What we have to achieve, uh, and and we need to know that th this is lasting for some years, and and not a change in the politicians every two or three years on the direct di direction. Thank you. We're, we're coming to the end of the webinar now, but if I can just ask two very quick, if I can just have quick thirty second response, if, if that's possible, Christian, the, just to get a last couple of questions. There's a question here. Europe is targeting polypropylene and PE film. Well, I think that's just coming now in Europe, isn't it? Um, uh, but in, in Canada, there are only end markets for PE film. What's driving the PP markets in Europe? The PP market itself? What is what, it's, yeah, it's what's, the end what's of the driving day? that demand for the flexible PP in terms of recycling it? Okay, this is a flexible PP is mainly driven by a 3D pre uh, PP recyclers, which can also use this material, mix it up and produce once again recyclates for 3D PP material. Okay, thank you. And Jan, very quickly, how difficult is it to convince the brands to have 10 SKUs ready for industrial trials by September 2020 for the phase three trials? Yeah, we have we do have 52 brand owned retailers. Not all of them have committed to, to those 10 SKUs. I said, I mean, some of them are coming with over 100. What I would like to have, I mean, I'm not too uh, focused on the 10. What I need is actually big, uh, fast turnover SKUs. If it's one, fine. If it's a couple of millions with one, it's even better, right? Um, but it, we're more talking about the quantities rather than really fixing on 10 SKUs. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Right. Well, I think I've eaten in, into the time for, for concluding. So I'll conclude very, very, very briefly by saying, I think, I mean, firstly, I think we could talk talk for another hour probably on the topic, if not two. I, I think for me, it feels like the beginning of a transition in Europe rather than the end of a transition. Clearly, these policy drivers, some aren't even in the legislation yet. Yeah, we're expecting them this year. So I think really we'll continue to see developments over, over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And as I mentioned after Christian's presentation, um, you, you know, the developments in technology have, has been incredible over the last 20 years, and I think, I think we'll see those continue. I think uh, with that, I'll conclude. I think we have some polls, which hopefully will appear on the screen as if by magic, um, just, to get some, just to get some feedback from, from people. I don't know if anyone can see them. I can't. Hopefully, if you can see them, if you could complete them, that would that would be great. I'll just give you some time to do that if they're there. Ah, okay. 
you need to go to the polls section. Here we are. Here, here we can see the polls now. On the, and they're also on the polls section. If you go there, you'll be able to to complete them. If you could do that before you log off, that would be very much appreciated. It's, it's e easier when we are all sitting together and the people can just ra raise their hands. Huh? <laughs> uh, ab absolutely. We, we could try that. We could try that as well. So we have the first, the first question, I believe, is which aspects of the webinar did you appreciate most? I think uh, if you, I, hopefully, as I say, you can go to these polls and complete them. But if not, then I'm sure if you put your responses in the chat, then they will be received as, as, as well. Next question, what, it's like an exam this, what other information would you be seeking on flexible plastics in the future? You may select more than one answer. So here we are, market trends, policy and legislations, standards development, something that's very important and happening in Europe at the moment, industry collaboration, recycling and recovery technologies and processes, product design innovation and R&D initiatives. I, I, I think that the in industry collaboration over the last five years was for, for me the, the biggest uh, de development compared in the past, that the uh, Holy Grail was founded, uh, that CFLEX was founded, close the glass loop, uh, forever green for pa pa paper, uh, I think that that was a in incredible big success and is a big success and, and it's helping a lot to make pa packaging circular. Hmm? Absolutely. And I think we, we also have the Circular Plastics Alliance in Europe as well, oh, yeah. which obviously involves all stakeholders in the, in the in the supply chain. And yeah, I think it's not possible for one, one element of the supply chain to do this on their own. I'm just waiting to see if there's a third question. Here we go. I think this is a final question. How would you value the webinar in terms of relevance and new acquired knowledge? Perfect. Okay, hopefully everyone's had enough time to answer those questions. Feedback much appreciated. So I will just close now. But before I do, I'd like to thank our three excellent speakers, really incredibly knowledgeable. I've learned things um, and hopefully you all have as well. So thank you, gentlemen, and uh, we'll say goodbye. Bye.